So some of the things that I wanted to talk about today are um, just sort of a discussion of the current understanding that we have of ureteral stent pain, a brief discussion on what our traditional thinking has been on peristalsis, and then to outline some of the recent advances and challenges um, that have come up to our understanding of the pathways involved in influencing stent inducing peristalsis in particular. And I just wanted to start with a brief history of ureteral stents. I've mentioned this at a previous um, talk, but really the thing about stents is that they actually started as a gum paste. And somehow that uh, translated into a tube and finally uh, began to be used in urology. So I think the, the, the history is interesting. But it's not really until about 1978 that people were more um, widely accepting of stents, primarily because the original stents had a lot of issues with migration um, and expulsion. So since the, the double J stents were um, created uh, first by um, Finney, uh, it's been widely used by urologists. And we now are asking ourselves what the value is of routine stenting, because as we know, there's no real established standard um, on when they should be used. 63% of urologists routinely stent, and um, although we know that ureteral double J stents are not indicated necessarily for uncomplicated ureteroscopy, that continues to be the case. Um, and what I'm going to focus on for this talk is the fact that with the use of stents, we actually have a lot of complications. So it's something to think about. What are some of these complications? We all have seen this infection, encrustation, patients will complain to us of sexual dysfunction, hematuria, lower urinary tract symptoms, and what we're going to talk about today, which is stent-associated pain. Now, all of the residents know that about 80% of our patients um, will have stent pain. 70% of those patients, um, uh, by various studies, have shown pain severe enough to reduce the activities by 50%. Uh, in some studies, up to 58% of patients will report reduced work capacity, 32% report sexual dysfunction, and in one study, 32% of patients had to have their stents removed sooner than anticipated because of pain. Right. So, you know, what exactly is the pathogenesis of stent pain? There have been various um, uh, proposed causes uh, which continue to be debated. It's likely multifactorial. Some of the things that people have talked about and looked into is the <coughs> idea of the vesicoureteral reflux causing an increase in intrarenal pressure, stent movement, stent durometer or the firmness of the stent, uh, stent dimensions including size and length, bladder irritation from the um, distal coil uh, irritating the afferent nerves at the trigone and bladder neck specifically, and then inflammation. But you know. These are all suggestions, um, things put forward by people. Do they actually cause pain? So we'll go through the list uh, and we'll talk about what's known about um, the work looking into some of these potential causes. So for instance, stent durometer, there have been several studies looking at whether the uh, durometer, as I said, the firmness of a stent actually affects stent pain. And there's no study um, that shows any statistically significant effect on pain. Stent size, believe it or not, does not affect stent pain. There have actually been several studies, including a meta-analysis, that has looked at different size stents, ranging from 4.8 up to 6 French stents, and uh, there's no uh, effect on pain. Stent length, which is something that we talk about a lot uh, when we're placing them, does not have any association to pain. It does have an association to bladder irritation, leading to things like urgency and frequency. Um, but several studies now have shown that patient have, patients have the same amount of pain uh, regardless of stent length, as well as stent positioning. Reflux, uh, we mentioned briefly. Now, the benefit of having um, decreased reflux is not quite clear. There have been some recent studies um, by two groups who have developed one-way valves at the distal portion of stents, trying to determine whether that leads to decreased pain. Uh, so far, the, it's a little bit controversial still, so stay tuned. And then bladder irritation. So the benefit of single J stents, which would be the thing that you would do to avoid bladder irritation from that distal coil, is not clear. There have actually been several studies, including one 
um, in the late 2000s by uh, Dr. Lingerman and crew who have looked at single J stents and shown that there was no difference in pain. There was some difference, again, in urgency and frequency. All right. And then inflammation. We've talked already about Dr. Chu um, and, uh, and uh, his colleagues and, and their work with the Trixan eluting stents, which did show some clinical benefit for um, uh, pain. And then finally, the only thing that really consistently has been shown to decrease stent pain is alpha blockers, which is why we give them um, to patients going home. And the idea behind that we'll talk a little bit about, but the theory is that alpha blockers relax the smooth muscle of the ureter as well as at the bladder neck, and that by so doing, they will reduce spasms. And the question is whether um, the relaxation of the bladder neck also decreases voiding pressure, which helps with uh, decreasing mm -hmm. pain. But none of that is clear. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what we've been doing to address that question. Well, you know, yes. when we put stents in for malignant obstruction and they've got chronic high growth, mm -hmm. we rarely get a phone call after. We put a stent in into a normal uh, caliber ureter with normal peristalsis yeah. in an acute setting after the velocity hit on That's when you get and all the calls. Pressure. Exactly. Just, you get zero phone calls. And there's some and questions. Not, it's not because they're a narcotic, because they've got cancer. A lot of times they're not, because a lot of times it'll be patients with strictures who, who um, you know, have some hydro from chronic stenting or, or whatever it is. Um, and that's something that we have been talking about, you know, what it is about this chronic hydronephrosis that may lead to patients not having as much of a reaction to stenting as they used to. So I'm not going to talk about that today, but it's something that we've been thinking about. So in terms of peristalsis um, and stent pain, that's sort of the final theory, that stents cause a dysfunction in peristalsis and that that somehow is playing a role in the associated pain that patients will pretend, um, present with. Some of the theories are that uh, the placement of stents causes a disruption of the coordinated smooth muscle contractions and that that leads to dysfunctional peristalsis and pain. Or that stents cause partial obstruction. So just as we were talking about this idea of, you know, hydronephrosis being associated with stents, it's not something that you think about. Stents are supposed to cause drainage. But what we see is that when you place stents in patients, there is actually, um, especially in patients with chronic stents, an increase in hydronephrosis. So the theory is that obstruction causes increased pressure, which can back up into the pelvis and increase the nephron and subcapsular hydrostatic pressure, and that that limited drainage <laughs> That hydronephrosis is what's associated with a good amount of the flank pain that our patients will present with. Okay. Just to take a step back and talk a little bit about the physiology of peristalsis before we move forward. So it, we know, or I've, I've discussed before, that it begins, we think, in the pilorureteral complex. The pelvic collects urine, it's, um, it then initiates this peristaltic wave uh, in the so-called pacemaker cells, which we still are not quite sure where they um, exist, but we think it's in that area. Now, those uh, contractions are conducted to the smooth muscle, and then <coughs> the ureter coapsis its walls, and peristalsis occurs. What we know is that the frequency of peristalsis is about two to six per minute in humans. Okay. How do those waves propagate? Well, we know that there are contractile proteins, actin and myosin, formed in the sarcoplasm of the cell, and that calcium is very much involved in this process, that the electrical activity is propagated from cell to cell, uh, we think through gap junctions, right? And then it moves proximally to distally, right? So stents and peristalsis. I've been talking about this, this idea of stents causing a peristalsis, and, and this is um, work that we've seen and work that others have shown as well. But there are a few studies on what those effects are. And um, the question is, well, what's the clinical applicability of doing in vitro studies? Because what we've seen is that endoluminal devices can change peristalsis, which makes it difficult to look at peristalsis. And that some of the extra luminal devices that have been created to date have been quite evolved, involved in terms of their usage and have questionable precision. So how can we answer these questions? So we decided to do an in vivo pig study and I'll talk a little bit about the methods. So we started with six-month-old pigs who uh, underwent cystoscopic unilateral stent placement. So what we had was an <coughs> internal control where the contralateral ureter was unstented. 
All right. The stents was kept in vivo for two, three, or 14 days. And I'll talk a little bit more about that protocol. Um, peristalsis is investigated at euthanasia. So uh, I'll, I'll show a video um, of that. And then we looked at the ureteral diameters. We then removed the ureters for various studies, which we'll go into. And we obtained urine at every point uh, so that we could uh, use that later for our biomarker um, identification experiments that Dr. Um, Lang alluded to earlier. We obtained blood and urine at each time point. And what I want to say here is that all cultures at every time point were negative. All right. And this is just to sh give you a sense of the hemoglobins. I know there's a lot going on here, but just to give you the basic sense that for the most part, hemoglobins uh, tend to be within the normal range. And the same thing was the case for creatinines, even with um, stent placement, which is something that we've seen. We know that we place a stent in a patient, their creatinine doesn't mm -hmm. tend to, um, unless they have CKD um, preoperative, their creatinine doesn't tend to um, make much of a change. So the first question is, well, how soon after placement do stents actually cause changes in ureteral function? And it turns out that it's quite soon. So here, um, I'll just focus your attention on the first two. So here you see just normal control pigs that were not stented at all, kidneys, ureters, bladders. Oh, sorry. Um, and then for stents that have, had, that, that have been placed for just 48 hours, you can see significant dilation here. All right. And even in stents, so what, what we did was to have two sets of pigs. We placed stents for two, um, two days. And then we also had another set, um, set of pigs where we placed stents for two days and then recovered those pigs for two days. So that means we took the stents out and then harvested them. And you don't see um, any recovery here, all right, after four days. And then again, in 14 days, you're seeing a significant difference in terms of the dilation of the ureter. And um, this maintained even after a one week recovery. So the fact that, you know, within 48 hours, we see this significant change was, was uh, interesting to us and had not been shown prior. So then, you know, just to sort of um, quantify this, you look at the significant changes in the ureteral diameter here. So for instance, uh, if you look at your 14 day stented pigs versus your non stented pigs, there's a significant difference. All right. Let's talk about hydronephrosis. <coughs> One of the things that we see, so again here, is uh, this is a 48-hour stented pig. Uh, you see your regular unstented ureter compared to your stented ureter. And you see the significant difference in terms of the um, size of the kidney. And this is just after two days. All right? And then you start to see the difference here. You can see the difference you know, in terms of uh, what's happening at the gross level uh, to these kidneys. And so we wonder if these are the sorts of things that happen to our patients. All right, and just to show here, so again, this is a 48-hour stented pig. We're doing IVPs on these um, pigs. Initially, uh, there was no hydronephrosis, and this is the contralateral and stented side, significant hydronephrosis on the right. So what I wanted to just show here um, is just two quick videos of what peristalsis looks like in this case. So um, I'll start with the stented ureter. And you can see the difference here between an unstented and stented ureter, again, just in terms of diameter. The peristalsis is very um, um, hard to see here. And one of the things that we also noticed is that we occasionally saw retrograde <coughs> peristalsis in these stented ureters as compared to, so you just see here this like very small peristaltic. <coughs> um, compare that to our stented ureter, if you look at where my, uh, my pointer is, you can see the peristaltic weight there. So when you quantify that, you see a significant difference in terms of the number of contractions in your stented pigs uh, versus your unstented pigs. So again, um, what we've shown here um, is that stenting your pig, even at 48 hours, causes significant differences in, their ability, in the ability of your um, ureter to move urine down into the bladder. And then just to show you what happens to these um, ureters on uh, a microscopic level. So here we're looking at just a control ureter. And then you start to see atrophy. You start to see uh, thickening of the wall. You start to see vacuolation. You start to see um, hyperplasia of your epithelium. Mm -hmm. And again, um, all of this is in a 48-hour period. Okay. 
uh, just to show you in the bladder, you're seeing some of these differences as well. You're seeing this, and again, everything is at the same application. You're seeing this uh, inflammatory infiltrate. You're seeing this sort of atrophy at the epithelial layer um, just from having a stent. <coughs> I just wanted, again, to quantify that here. Uh, you see the significant differences. Um, so what we wanted to do was to actually look at the force of contractions and see what the differences are with stenting. Uh, if our theory is that stenting causes a partial obstruction and stenting affects the um, ureter, how does it do that? So you've seen this setup before. I've used this um, for the uh, human ureter experiments. But just to uh, go quickly again, what we do is we have a ring of ureteral tissue that we then subject to uh, an electrical current. And then we can use a manometer to uh, quantify the strength of the contraction there. So we maintain the tissue in preps buffer at 4 degrees, and uh, the experiment is performed within 48 hours of harvest to make sure that the tissue um, uh, remains viable. And uh, we have a full thickness ring of ureteral tissue. I just wanted to show you quickly here what that all means. So we subject it to, if you look here, and then you can see, you can see that reaction. Okay. And so we can measure that. All right. What we saw at 48 hours again uh, in the non scented pig is uh, a, 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 um, a contractility. Now it looks like there's increased contractility with the 48 hours um, scented pig. But what we find is that because of the fact that the diameter is so much larger, you're getting a larger um, value for force. But in fact, when you account for diameter, what we find is that the contractility is significantly decreased in the stented pigs, as we saw uh, grossly. I just want to point your attention here to our 14-day pigs that were recovered for a week. And that is when we start to see a little bit of recovery in the contractility there. So it seems as if we need at least a week or more after stenting to start to have the ureters recover. And so what probably, what you know, we are suggesting might be happening with our patients is we treat our patients with a stent, we take them out, they don't come back for a couple of weeks, we don't do imaging for several weeks after that, and so we don't see these differences. <coughs> All right, but it's something... Clarify that those stents were put in for seven days and then removed and then examined seven days later. Yeah, 14, in days. 14, 14 days. 14, in for 14 days, days removed, removed, kept without stents for a week, for and then days. harvested. Mm-hmm. Did you study the option of partial obstruction mm -hmm. without a stent? Partial obstruction without a stent. Yeah, do you have any model for that? Because how do you know it's obstructing the stent that's about Well, because on well, because we have our internal control of the contralateral ureter not having a stent, right? But it's not and obstructed either, so how is that he's asking if you've got a partial obstruction to model the hypothesis of the stent. That is stentless. I did not do that here. Um, we do have uh, some data with a partial obstruction model in mice, um, but I didn't do that here, no. I mean, in the face of unilateral obstruction, the contralateral kidney picks up the extra work, and so you're going to have a higher uh, urine output on the contralateral kidney. So mm -hmm. Again, it's important to basically have an equal situation on both sides, otherwise, uh, as John is pointing out, you really don't know what your control is. Mm -hmm. So must be studies on a partial structure. Uh, there are. Um, so I haven't seen any. Like I was going to say there. Yeah. So, and there, there's a lot of work from several decades ago. Uh, the recent work looking at this sort of thing has not been done in pigs. Um, and it's been, like I said, some work in my, some of which we've done. Um, we haven't done that here. So something else that I wanted to talk about is the fact that what we noticed with stenting is that it in fact um, leads to what we're calling non-purposeful spasms. So again, this is the 14-day uh, control, unstented. And... Uh, we see a, a single contraction. When we uh, subject the 14-day stented ureter to the same stimul stimulus, we notice these 
recurrent waves. Uh, and we thought that that was interesting. Um, I had not expected that. Particularly um, when we uh, treated pigs with EPO, because we noticed that here, so again, we're seeing these sort of non-purposeful spasms, but when we treated the ureters with EPO, we see actual decrease of these spasms. And so uh, we do know that erythropoietin, as I've mentioned from a previous talk, has some known activity in restoring peristalsis in non-urologic tissue, and we think that it may play a role in, in urologic <clears throat> tissue. In, um, I'm sorry, in, in uh, yeah, play a role in urologic tissue. And so uh, that's interesting to us. The other thing I wanted to mention here is uh, you notice that with tamsulosin, there are these non-purposeful spasms. So if the theory of tamsulosin is that it decreases spasming, uh, we're not seeing that here. Um, and in fact, what we do see um, if we're looking at contractility is that if you pay attention to the tamsulosin unscented and stented pigs, there's a significant increase in the contractility in the stented pigs that have been treated with tamsulosin. So that's a, um, a little bit different from what we were expecting and, and we think fascinating and something that we're continuing to look at. Yeah. And then just briefly, we did quite a bit of um, RT-PCR, uh, but for the purposes of time, I wanted to just focus on one set of experiments here. So we talked about the glee proteins before and we've talked about uh, their involvement in smooth muscle contractility in general and our thoughts that they may play a role in smooth muscle contractility in the ureter. Uh, we also talked about stents and stent inflammation and wanted to look at uh, several uh, molecules involved in uh, inflammation like COX-2 as well as our glee proteins. And what we've seen, and this here is uh, in pigs that were stented for uh, 14 days, is that you know, the, uh, at least at the RNA level, the expression of the glee proteins, glee 1 and glee 3, are associated with the expression of COX-2. I show COX-2 here, but we've also looked at IL-6. Um, and so this idea of there being an increase in these, um, uh, at least at the RNA level in the proximal ureter, we thought was interesting. Um, and what that led us to do was to start thinking about what potential biomarkers for stent-induced pain and stent-induced uh, symptoms might be. Uh, and so one of the things that we did was to uh, think about meta metabolomics analysis. So what metabolomics is, is, is the study of a set of metabolites that might be present within an organism or a cell or a tissue, in this case, the ureter. And what we're going to be doing, uh, what we are doing for this particular study, is using a mix of capillary electrophoresis and mass spectrometry to identify urinary metabolites. So I mentioned that we were able to obtain urine from uh, our pigs at every time point. And so once we um, are able to optimize this method, we're going to use something called principal component analysis, which is a method of summarizing data that enables us to reduce the number of characteristics used so that we can ease the comparisons. Because what happens in uh, looking for metabolites is that any one um, protein has multiple metabolites. And so you become confused very quickly. So what we're trying to do is to um, sort of bring things down to the simplest metabolites. Uh, so what we wanted to do here, I mentioned that we had been looking at some of these inflammatory molecules, the COX-2, IL-6, etc., is we wanted to focus on COX-2 and we wanted to focus on some of the metabolites of COX-2. Uh, and so we focused initially on PGE2 and one of its metabolites, um, PGEM. Now we're still optimizing, but what we've been able to um, successfully do so far is to uh, clarify our peaks uh, mm -hmm. at the um, just standard sample level. And then we've moved on to pooled urine samples and we're seeing nice um, peaks there. Uh, so the next step for us is to uh, look at a couple other metabolites and then we're going to move on to our urine specimens. So I'm really excited about that because the idea there is for us to try to identify biomarkers that we can use to help us to figure out what's going on uh, with sense. And so the next steps would be to continue some of the RT-PCR work, but moving into the protein studies. I'm not going to show this because they're not complete yet, but we've already begun some of this 
uh, we're looking at immunohistochemistry to look at expression of some of these proteins that I've been talking about um, at the um, uh, tissue level. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, Westerns and ELISA uh, as confirmatory assays. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to move into sample analysis for a metabolomic study. So, yeah. so what are some of our conclusions here? First, we think that ureteral scenting results in severe changes, um, even within 48 hours, uh, which is something that had not been quite clear prior to these studies, <clears throat> and that these changes persist much longer than previously thought. That stents impair ureteral motility, which we've shown, and uh, we think that they may actually impede stone passage. Um, we've shown that tamsulosin does not appear to decrease muscle spasms, that in fact it increases contractile force, but it does not seem to um, affect the rate of peristalsis in stented ureters, as I showed um, in my uh, uh, previous work here. Then erythropoietin seems to decrease non-purposeful spasms in stented ureters. Now, what does that mean? It may mean that it's suggesting a potential role for prophylactic erythropoietin in peristaltic recovery on partial obstruction, mm -hmm. such as occurs with stenting, but obviously more work needs to be done on that front. Uh, we looked at GLE-1 expression, and we think that at least at the RNA level, uh, GLE-1 and GLE-3 may correlate with increased inflammation, and so that these may be biomarkers that we um, need to look at further. And that we think that prostaglandin E2 uh, may in fact have potential as a biomarker for stretch-induced inflammatory changes, such as we see with ureteral stem placement. And uh, I wanted to end by acknowledging Dr. Lang and Dr. Chu, uh, who have uh, been wonderful mentors for me and have been um, very patient with uh, some of my, uh, let's do this, let's do that, let's move there. So thank you for your patience with that. Uh, for Dr. Luang and Dr. Chen Shou, uh, who have been helping me with the electrophysiology experiments and um, giving me the run of their of their equipment so I can do these studies, and then our collaborators, Dr. Chen and uh, Xiao Hang at the uh, Department of Chemistry, who've been doing some of the um, principal component analysis uh, with us. And I will stop here for questions.